Good afternoon once again and welcome to our final session of the day. Um, here in the climb, it's so great to be back in our, in our physical space. Um, and for the last time today, I will say the housekeeping things and I don't even need to look at my notes. We're not expecting a fire alarm. If there is one, we will need to leave. Um, we are taking photos and recording this session, so if, and we'll be using it for marketing and uh, further communication processes in the future. So if you do have a uh, concern with that, then you need to let us know now or sit at the back where you can't be filmed. So <laughs> thank you very much for that. So the session then this afternoon that we've got, uh, the final one, I've got a nice panel of, of guests here behind me. I'm just going to introduce one of them um, and he is going to do the rest of the work for us. So I'm going to introduce Alex Toft. Alex is the head of Minerva Business Angels, part of the University of Warwick Science Park Limited, one of the most prolific investors in Midlands startups and UK angel networks. He is a winner of the Barclays Enterprise Award Regional Icon for 2020, a former biotech entrepreneur and inventor, raising £72 million in the process. He launched the first National Children's Air Ambulance, a previous interim director at Public Health Wales, whose co earlier career was spent as a commercial marketing executive in Unilever, ICI, and INEOS, with expatriate tours in Brazil and Indonesia. A firm believer in lifelong learning, collecting an MBA, Masters in Law, and degrees in Law and Chemistry along the way, a holder of 10 patents, awarded the University of Liverpool Potts Medal for his contribution to science, and published in several international it says intentional in this, international medical journals, uh, an active investor in his own right. He is Alex Toft. Thank you. Thank you. That was a bit of a mouthful, really, wasn't it? Um, I would call that more of a checkered career rather than a, a directed career. So what we're going to do today is we have two of our esteemed investors, two of the companies that we received investment. Um, as uh, Wendy said, we run the Minerva Business Angel Network. Um, and we're one of the largest in the UK. We're obviously one of the most professional ones, of course, that goes without staying. And um, at our current track record, we we're probably on for a record year, which is quite interesting with respect to COVID. So why are we here today? Well, in terms of having investment and raising investment, uh, one of the things that I wanted to pose to this panel was, um, are investors from Mars and founders from Venus? I mean, it feels like that, to be honest with you, at some times. So what I want to do is each panel tell you a little bit about their journey, what they've done, how they've arrived here, and also our colleagues who are investors as well, who have their own esteemed careers. And I have to tip my hat to Elizabeth, whose CV is far better than mine. So, um, and she can explain all, all about that and her experience. And then what we're going to do, we're going to have an interactive session where the panel are going to um, obviously answer some questions, and questions from me, and questions from the audience, questions from people on Zoom. I'd like them to have a bit of discussion as well amongst themselves, differing opinions. Let's make this sparky. It's the end of the day, um, and we'd like a sparky debate. Um, controversial opinions are welcome. There's no such thing as a bad opinion, only a free opinion. So, if I can start with Steve, who I'll let you introduce yourself, and then we'll go Steve, Elliot, David, Elizabeth. Hi there, thanks very much. Uh, so, my name's Steve Barber. I'm the uh, founder of a company called Composite Braiding Limited. So, Composite Braiding is a company that uh, was set up to look at higher volume, lower cost structural uh, composites. By composites, I mean things like carbon fiber, glass fiber, and so forth. Um, Currently, uh, it's a, a material which is of great interest because of decarbonisation. It makes things a lot lighter. But a lot of the processes that are involved in that are very manual, and so therefore it makes them very low volume and quite costly. So I saw a gap in the market. I've been running, uh, previous to that, four different composite manufacturing businesses, so I know the market pretty well. Saw a gap for the higher volume, lower cost, and uh, saw a route, a processing route, down which we could go and uh, set up the business. Uh, the net result is we now have a capability to make a, uh, a composite structural part in a fraction of the time. 15 hours is reduced to 15 minutes. Uh, we reduce energy by up to 98%, and we've got scrap rates of less than 1%. So that really is market leading in terms of where we are. Um, 
I'm an ex-marketing guy. I was in Rolls-Royce before I got, came into composites. Uh, I used to be head of marketing for Rolls-Royce, so clearly I can tell a good story. But actually, uh, we've also won two global innovation awards, a uh, manufacturing award, and last week we won a, a materials innovation award and also a, a regional um, problem-solving award. Um, so there's some, some better pedigree to what it is that we're actually doing. Um, so in terms of why I'm here today, uh, we raised some money uh, through Minerva, uh, also through some private investors and also some debt. Uh, and that came to a little over a million pounds, and that was uh, concluded in January 2020. And I have to say, I must be one of the luckiest guys around because I didn't know there was a pandemic coming. So it was kind of good timing. That's Composite Braiding, and I'm Steve Barber. I'll just pass you across. Uh, so you can probably tell who the uh, millennial founder is here uh, in the hoodie. Um, but yeah, my name's Elliot Parnham, um, founder and CEO of Skyfo Limited and our tagline is making drone delivery possible uh, and that's what we push ourselves to do we bring together all of the uh, technology systems and processing compliance that you would need to do a just-in-time uh, logistical operation with drones and that's in various networks being drone agnostic so that goes from the sort of hub to hub capability with big bulky drones doing sort of uh, 1.5 ton payload logistics down to the middle mile in a hub centric uh, hope to spoke uh, use case, uh, i.e. into a hospital or between hospitals, uh, and then finally down to the middle mile. And what we're pushing for is to be the management solution uh, for this complex network of um, logistical operations and flight operations too. So I started this whole thing about four and a half years ago, uh, back at um, the end of my degree in aerospace engineering at Coventry University. I did this thing called the IMACI UAS Challenge. Uh, where we had to build a drone to do some autonomous missions. And it was there that I found that um, learning some amazing skills here to be used in society to benefit society uh, in a medical use case. And um, that's where it all started. Um, I, I since went on to do uh, a master's in astronautics and space engineering because I wasn't quite ready to let go of that engineering passion. Um, but eventually I did and moved into more of an entrepreneurial role and got some support from uh, a few incubators and and accelerators as well, won the uh, Judges' Choice Award at the uh, Santander Emerging Entrepreneurs Challenge, uh, and also uh, won uh, some money from the Do It Fund with Santander again, and um, Coventry University Enterprises. Um, Skyfarer have, uh, if you're pardon the pun, taken off a little bit uh, over the past year. We're uh, the 100th company to be backed by the ESA BIC in the UK. Uh, we're also in the Barclays Eagles Labs, uh, and we're also part of the Wayra 5G accelerator pushing that technology um, forward. Uh, so yeah, onwards, onwards and upwards for us. Uh, we've got some really exciting uh, trials planned with, uh, with the NHS uh, next year. Thanks to you. David. Great, uh, good afternoon. Hi, I'm uh, David Wilson. Um, I'm a business uh, angel, have been so for the last five years. And last count, I think I've made seven investments. Um, six different companies, seven investments. I sold my company to a multinational 22 years ago. I actually stayed with the multinational for 16, 17 years. Um, so I always like to say that I come with a corporate discipline, but also the entrepreneurial skills of a, you know, a small company and investor. Um, so as well as business angel investing, I'm currently working with quite a range of private equity companies, again, in the whole investment field and act uh, as an advisor to the, the private equity uh, businesses. So, that's me. Thank you. Thanks, David. Hi, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Gooch. Um, I'm not quite sure which part of the fence I should really be sitting on. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. I started my own technology business way back before networks were invented. I don't think anyone else in the room is old enough to remember then. Um, but I built a technology product, invented a market space, uh, created a company, we were listed on the um, alternative investment market, raised money there, um, grew well, moved from perpetual licensing model to a subscription licensing model, grew six million of annual recurring revenue in about three years on three to five year contracts and we had an offer to, for the company to be acquired by an American software company in 2017 and the investors generally decided that it was a good thing to do as the multiples that they were getting back in terms of returns were phenomenal. So the company was sold. 
and that left me unemployed. And um, so I decided I would start again, but I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, looking for a bright idea. And then people like Alex came along and said, why don't you invest in some startups? And what I realized is actually I'd got more to offer than the money. Having been there, done it, got a lot of battle scars, I could help startups learn from my messes and get some lessons from there and help them to succeed more quickly than I did. Um, so actually that's what I do. So I invest in companies, I work with them to help them to grow. Um, and actually I sit here also as an investee company, which both Alex and David invest in, because one of the businesses that I'm helping is a turnaround. Um, we did a management buy-in, raised some money, which David and Alex both invested in. Um, and I'm actually acting as CEO in that company as well. So pretty busy in my third act in my life, which I plan to make my most successful. My main goal is get small startups from seed round to 1 million of annual recurring revenue in 12 to 18 months. So we have less failures at startup rate, which the startup failure rate is phenomenal. And we want to try and, try and reduce that as much as I can. So that's, my, that's where I come from. That's my goal. Okay, so one thing I want to point out, since we had the Millennium Comet, so uh, you know, investors come from a wide age profile, with our youngest being 27. I suppose it's indicative of the Midlands, we don't have enough unicorns yet, and so we have a younger generation, as say the Silicon Valley does. Uh, but we do have some younger technical or, or entrepreneurs as well. So we don't want this concept of, you traditionally was male, pale and stale. So we're definitely trying to break that. So since you think you know, you're the only millennium here and why we put this panel together is we wanted to bring you vast amount of experience. So as the millennium investor dealing with these old fogies as the implication is there, you know, what do you think it's like raising investment? Well, what are your, what are your top line experiences that you think that you could share? Um, I think first of all, my hairline receded dramatically in the process. Um, it's challenging. That's why, that's why we look old, we're not really. We just <laughs> raised a lot of money. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely challenging and they bring a, a wealth of questions that I wouldn't think about because I'm not, you know, experienced in life really in comparison uh, just yet. So, um, yeah, I think my, my focus was to surround myself with people that have been through the process before uh, and I've got that experience to, to deal with those sort of challenging questions so that I could prepare myself for those. But still, I found they're quite understanding at the same time. They're not sort of scary um, people in general. Um, they, they understand where you are. Um, they understand that process as well, because um, many of them have been through it before themselves. Um, so that was quite reassuring going through this process as well, yeah. So, so what are you going to tell yourself when you're 80? About this process. Um, I think phew, that's a difficult question about the process of getting investment for a millennial if that's what you want I think just get stuck into it and and don't hold back be completely honest um, they're not gonna bite you some of them do um, uh, but but it's completely fine I mean this entrepreneurship is, is a learning process it's all around getting feedback uh, and learning from it and doing something about it and not worrying about the, the, the problems or the failures. So um, try and get that feedback at the very least. Don't just um, uh, stop with a no, get something from it. So okay, Elizabeth, you, you had your idea that was uh, groundbreaking, nobody else was using it. So what have you advice have you got to some dudes on the beginning of that journey trying to you know, build a business and raise money. What, what's your top three How, how long have you got? Um, <coughs> let's just pick up on the age point to start with, right? I, I'm not offended, right? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't really care about age. I reckon it's, your age is defined by how hard you play and I can keep you awake all night, trust me. And I mean drinking, obviously, nothing else. Um, but I sat in a bank manager's office, age 26, trying to get a bank account saying, I am going to invent a technology product that will reduce productivity in financial services organizations by 25%. And he laughed and he went, I don't think so. So I went and did it anyway. And I got every bank virtually in this country, Citigroup, 200,000 users using my software. And I did want to give him the flick, but he died unfortunately, so I couldn't do it. So, cause he was old. So, 
that's the you know I, think, I don't think age is relevant at all and I if someone tells you no you can't do something that to me is the red flag that's like I'm bloody going to do it anyway so just go do it uh, I'm going to tell you if ever you come across Guy Feld at Hargreave Hale he's the most scary investor I've ever sat in front of just to warn you he sat with his back to me in a meeting because he was cheesed off with me because we'd, we'd missed our numbers for a period so he just turned his back on me and he wouldn't speak just wouldn't speak and then we I sort of looked at his assistant and he went so I went right so I did the presentation and he just got up and walked out and that was in it he ended up giving us more money but you could not tell so I, I actually think they like to well I don't know whether they do so much now I think there's a sea change going on but they used to like to play cat and mouse I think and keep you dangling a bit and I think the sort of infrastructure that's being created the ecosystem to support startups comes from the top in government and it's permeating the right the way through and I think they're starting to realize if you watch them on LinkedIn that they've got to do more than just give money they've actually got to help and if they just sit back then then it will fail so in terms of top top advice don't take no I think my first number one thing about getting money is sell to your customers first it's the cheapest money that you can raise um, and you need to get three early adopter clients and at least some evidence that that customer will buy at some point if not already bought and then get in front of them and it gives you some credibility unless you've got a total light bulb idea and a great team um, that everybody thinks is really sexy and at the minute drones I would say is in the sexy space a um, bit like cyber was in the sexy space and now all the investors are disappointed with cyber so if you get in there early with a bright idea then I think you, you're probably fine but just just keep going if you believe in it passionate about it just keep going just do it and David what do you look for I think the key is, <clears throat> the key word here is investment so as an investor you're looking for a return on your investment I mean let's cut to the chase that's exactly what it's about and then you ask a series of questions what is it I'm investing in or we're investing in and again you could go through a list it's people it's the business it's the macroeconomic uh, environment etc etc but it's an investment. And I think you need to, 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 to the point, um, there is no room for people being aggressive, but there is, I think, virtue in being intellectually curious. And that's from both sides, the investor and the investee. And I think one of the things that I'm seeing more now is that people are being more intellectually curious on both sides, which can only be a good thing. Um, but I'm afraid I come across a lot of pitches where people are asking me for my money and quite honestly they haven't thought through what it is they're going to do with my money. And so if my questioning comes across as being aggressive, whatever else, then it's not meant to be, but it's simply pointing out you need to give more thought as to why it is you've come to ask for money. And I think that would be the general, general point. And I'm closer to 80 than... Uh, than you are, so <laughs> what are the learnings? And the learnings are, it's an investment. Be dispassionate. That doesn't mean to be, uh, say, you're impersonal, because one of the things I would look for in, in, in people are, do, are they personable? Because I think at the end of the day, business is about people, and those who are more personable in a variety of contexts, by and large, assuming the business models, right, the funding, right, et cetera, will tend to do well. So a kind of a long answer, Alex. Okay, thank you. I mean, we've all been through the power trip to individuals who um, uh, will give you a lot of money, but they'll make you sing and dance and do all sorts of things for it. So they are out there, and they're often frequently the biggest check writers. So unfortunately, it can be a foible. But Steve, Steve has a unique, um, should we say, gift. He's turned down a venture capitalist. Um, so tell me a little bit about your investor uh, journey because everybody runs to the venture capitalist as the golden fountain of money, um, but you know it's not always the case. So Steve, you know, what was your decision process when you came to look for investment? So clearly, I mean, taking on David's point, we had a, a clear idea about the sort of monies that we wanted to raise. We had a clear idea about the direction of the business that we wanted to to, to go in, and 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 so. Based on that, um, I therefore had a view in terms of uh, clearly how much money, but 
when you then start talking to, say, angels or private investors or VCs or whomever it happens to be, clearly there's terms and conditions associated with those. And there's not a right or a wrong answer to this. It's not as though a particular route is good and another route is bad. It's down to the individual companies, the individual circumstances. And with the business plan that we had, the vision I had for the business, um, one of the things I asked up front from the VCs, because um, there were a couple of them that, that were potentially willing to offer some capital, was to get a term sheet and just to see actually what the structure of the deal would be from those VCs to see did it actually fit well with what I wanted to do with the business. And uh, so decided in that particular instance, at that particular time, it wasn't really a good fit for the philosophy of, of what I wanted to do in terms of building the manufacturing business and in terms of some of the, the goals that we had for that particular business. And that's not to say it won't be right at some time in the future. And it, it's certainly not true to say that it's not right and it's not a good route to go down. But we did take a very conscious decision when we had a look at the terms to go, it's not right for us now. This really isn't the sort of route that we want to go down. So therefore, I went with a completely different funding route, which does fit with the philosophy of how we're trying to grow the business and, and really have something that's around for, for many decades uh, from now. Um, in the form that we're trying to, to build it. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, turned down some VC funding, and as has been said in a private conversation before we came in today, that will either prove to be a very brave and, and wonderful decision or completely stupid, and time will tell. Thank you. Elliot, what about crowdfunding? What's your general view? Um, I, well, for us, it, it wasn't something that we, um, we went down. I think um, uh, we, we went down sort of an angel syndicated round route. Uh, that seemed more appropriate for the stage that we were at and for that sort of business to business market. But I think if you're selling a product, um, I think there's a lot of potential success uh, in crowdfunding. But it's not something that, that we felt was the right fit for us at this stage. Okay, thank you. So, Elizabeth, what's the biggest bugbear when you come in to invest in some of these small companies? Oh, I had one lady who actually asked her if I could give her her money back because she drove me berserk. She was a professional investor, but she had she used to record our meetings, have them transcribed, and she'd read the notes back, and then she'd go, "Last meeting you said," and you're like, "You know, business is not like that. You know, you say stuff because in the." in good faith, because that's what you expect to happen, but it doesn't always. And I think she'd invested something like £18,000, classed as a professional investor. And I was just like, can I just give her her money back? She's driving me mad. Um, so what would be the biggest bugbear about investors? I'm, I don't know. I, I don't think there is a bugbear, to be honest. I mean, investors... As soon as you take investors' money, I think it's worth saying the business is no longer yours. You're taking other people's money. And so you have to make an, a mental shift between I, my, to our business. Absolutely. And, and as the invest, investing person, what's the biggest bugbear when you come in to invest? I'll just finish that point. So if you're thinking about it's our money, you, can't, you, you have to take what they they're saying and listen to what they're saying even if you don't necessarily agree with it so you've got to respect their input i think what's my my biggest bugbear as an investor is receiving pitch decks unsolicited that say can i have five hundred thousand? and i've never met the person before and that is the equivalent i say of am i allowed to say it having sex on the first date it's very rare that it happens and when it does it's not necessarily great so, you know, would you do that is the question. And I, would I invest in somebody that just pitches me a, a pitch deck on LinkedIn? Probably not. Um, obviously, through COVID, that's made it difficult for people to network and get to know people. But your type of events actually help with that and overcome that. But I think unsolicited pitches. And then I had somebody troll me on LinkedIn the other day because I hadn't replied. And genuinely, I get seven or eight of these a day. You know, if I sat and went through eight pitch decks, I wouldn't be looking after your money because <laughs> I wouldn't be doing my expanded job. So, you know, you, you can't do it. And I, I think that's, that's, that's a bit of an unreal expectation. And, and David, what's your bugbear when you come to invest? What do, we, what do founders irritate you with the most? Because we're going to give the chance for the founders <laughs> to respond, of course. <clears throat> well, uh, you know, 
I'm having to be negative here, but there's a lot of positive things. But what, one of the things that really annoys me and, um, is how sometimes there's a great focus on fundraising and how they're going to do it, why they're going to do it, etc., etc., and not enough focus on the business, the opportunity, the business model, what is the environment in which that business will operate, what is the competitive intensity of that business, how are you going to differentiate, etc., 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 and yet we get this, I hear this all the time. Um, once we've raised that money, we'll then go for another round. And so, and, and it strikes me that any business that is likely to be successful has the ability to look after money, cash. And when I see those businesses where the cash flow forecast is half a page and the funding sequence and rounding is four or five pages, I'm not interested. So I like businesses who will preserve cash, who will use cash wisely, as well as raise funds, as well as raise funds. But those businesses that don't demonstrate that they have the wherewithal and through their business plan, et cetera, to show how they allocate that very finite resource called cash, that annoys me. And Steve, your right of response. What's the biggest book <laughs> I'm gonna answer it slightly differently, actually. Um, I mean, I've, I've got lots of experience. I was in a multinational for 19 years. I then ran four manufacturing businesses as really a business manager, turning them around. And the thing that really, um, when I, I started this business, the, the bit of experience that I didn't have and I knew I didn't have it was actually how do you pitch to these guys? Who are they? What, do they actually, what are they actually interested in? Because I, I can sell stuff, I can sell technical things, I can sell commercial things. I know who my audience is in, in my area. But in terms of angel investors, I mean, I obviously knew about them, I knew that it was something I was interested in potentially, but I really didn't know what the beast looked like and actually what do you say to them how, and how do you say these things? So the, 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 it wasn't so much a bugbear as such, it was more a case of actually thinking, I truly don't know what they want to be listening to and that I need to be saying in order to actually make a case for investment. Um, so it, it wasn't a bugbear, but it was something where I got absolutely no idea at all about who I was going to be talking to. So therefore, I went on quite a few training uh, courses to go and actually learn about that uh, so that I could at least get something which was going to be pitch worthy. I have to say, however, that when you go into various different pitches with different organizations, the uh, guidance is always slightly different. So my only bit of advice there is know your audience, listen to the person who's actually coaching you, and go and do what they say you need to go and do, and chances are you'll, be, you'll have some element, hopefully, of success. Um, in terms of the question you raised earlier, I don't know if it's too early, but I'm... I'm blowing the gaff on this, but your question about investors being Mars and, and we being Venus, um, I would actually say there was a huge spectrum of, of investors. Um, in terms of the pitches that I made, I did have some uh, aggressive questioning at times. Other times, uh, I didn't. Uh, so I wouldn't ever portray it as being something where I needed to be super resilient. I needed to have answers to very good questions. I needed to know my business. I needed to know what I was asking for or why I was asking for it. I needed to think on my feet. But equally, it wasn't a you know, dragon's den type of approach, typically. Um, there was some, some interesting questioning from time to time. But most of the time, it was just a very structured, good quality debate. Um, and, and I was, yes, I was tested in terms of do I know my business and do I know what the opportunity is? Because these are investors, and they want to get a return. And Elliot. Um, so, I think, what have I learned from this, from this journey of uh, getting investment? Um, like I said, I, I went into this a bit blind. Obviously, I'm generally quite young. I haven't done this before. Um, but going back to the point of, of, of no, uh, I found out quite early on that I don't like being told no. And I think it's a, uh, it's a trait uh, as an entrepreneur you need to have. You need to have that tenacity. If you get told no, um, try and turn it into a yes um, and I was on a path to go into the RAF I wanted to be an officer 
and uh, obviously you need to do what you're told there. So that was a, a shocking uh, learning curve for me. Um, and, then I, and then I tried going into a, a career role and I did some work at Triumph Motorcycles and again it was the same situation. So uh, everything led me into that entrepreneurial path and um, I quickly learned that y you will get no's um, but you, you have to again get feedback from it and during this process I tried to treat it as a conversation where I could with the investors rather than me talking at them uh, to get as much from that as possible so that I could learn uh, and get better in the process. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and in my job where I get to review 500 pitches a year, so it's frightening how many pitches I've reviewed, I think the things that the messages I would really transmit is money isn't free. Um, so some people charge, some people don't, but people think the ones who do, don't charge to help you raise, it's free. No, it's not, you pay in the term sheet. And the number of people that kind of hedge their bets where somebody's charging a fee when they don't look at the total picture that's been offered for that particular one. The second thing is, uh, founders don't take raising money seriously. Um, it's an unnecessary evil um, into some founders and they can frequently, when they take that approach, be terrible time wasters. And then the third thing is when you get a no, and it's good to hear what you said, Elliot, because I've had some people look at me as though I've just shot their rabbit. You know, it, 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 a no doesn't mean no, it's no good in terms of what you're offering. It means no, it's no good in terms of, not no good is perhaps a bit too strong, but it's not what we want to see for our particular group. Because I can assure you some of the weirdest things get funded. Um, and sometimes it amazes me, even I go, really? Um, and that's in, in, in some respects the advantage of the SEIS and EIS tax system. And if you don't know about that, please go and look it up. So we've got another 15 minutes left. Um, so I'm going to invite anybody got any burning questions. Um, it's an opportunity for you. Uh, thank, thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, it was. It was um, I mentioned earlier about uh, having to kiss uh, a lot of frogs before you find your prince. I'd just like to know sort of expectation or in terms of expectation management from when you've raised money, how long has it taken between the, the, the sort of start and, and actually uh, getting some, uh, somebody saying yes and actually sticking that money in your bank and just to give people a, an indication of what that process might, uh, might look like. Steve? Uh, so for us, I would say roughly probably about nine months, um, probably from first idea of pitch into getting money into the bank. Um, as I said earlier, timing was everything on that. Uh, but equally, I'd also done some training earlier than that, so quite possibly a year in terms of total time spent. Um, the actual documentation bit wasn't really that long and that complicated. Um, but yeah, I had to learn who am I going for, why am I doing it, et cetera, and, and really learn that, that, that amount of it. Elliot? Uh, I think it really depends on, on who, you're, who you're pitching to. Um, if, it's, uh, if, it's, if it's a group, it can take a little bit longer. Um, uh, there's a bit more, more, more discussions to be had, but there are some other people that are a little bit more, more keen on the process and want to get that money in because they are captivated and excited. Um, by the journey, um, but but for us, um, yeah, I'd, I would agree with the sort of eight-month period is, is quite realistic. Uh, although there were some investments in that round that happened within a matter of a week, uh, so it can vary quite a lot. We we have seen venture capitalists take a lot longer, and and we have seen some venture capitalists one whereby angels have peeled away because they've taken that long. I mean, it depends on the size of the raise. A venture capitalist will make, for example make you undergo a, uh, a medical, so it, maybe it's the first time you've given blood to raise money. So that does happen. So the next question, because I want to try and give as many people the chance to raise a question as possible. Thank you. Um, so as an investor, what is the, that one thing that tips the scale for you? You know, that one thing that gets you to say yes, even when other factors about the business are not overwhelmingly convincing? David. <clears throat> I don't know there is one thing. Um, certainly in my case, I'm looking for a number of factors which are favorable to the investment. And you may then say you weight each of these factors in a different proportion. 
Um, and, you know, we like to, not we, but it's, people like to speak about the gut feel. And, of course, there is a gut feel. Um, another thing you'll hear people say is, it's all about the people. Well, what does that mean? Um, what it means to me is I like people who are personable, pragmatic, intellectually curious, understand what they're doing, and also are willing to learn. Um, I've, you know, when you reach my age, you hear people speak about experience. And sometimes I look at certain people and I think, you say you've got 30 years experience, what you've actually got is one year repeated 30 times. Um, and there's a big difference. So I'm always looking for people who have experience but have actually shown how they've adapted what they're, they're doing. So again, sorry, long answer, there's no one thing. There's always a number of factors. And some investments, there are more factors than others. Um, there was one investment that was easy. That was Expandly. Elizabeth was leading it. Job done. <laughs> Adi Elizabeth. I should be coming back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to answer as well? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, actually, it's three things for me that tip it, and there's one thing that turns me off completely. Um, banging on about product, and I've built this, and I've built that, and I've built the other, and it's the best widget on the planet, turns me off. What turns me on, not sex on the first date, is three things. Value, growth, and market. Value is what value does this solution, whatever it is, actually deliver to the consumer or the, the business that you want to sell it to. So what's the value proposition for the customer? And can you, can you clearly articulate what that is? That's number one. The second thing is, show me how you're going to grow this from one or two people to lots of people. So there's a growth thing in it as well. So how, do you, how are you going to grow? And thirdly, are there enough of those people for that engine that you think is the growth engine available to actually create a market that's big enough to deliver the numbers that you're saying that you're going to deliver. So that's, that's the recipe that I look for. And then I look at the ridiculous hockey stick graph and I took that out and I look at the Gartner magic quadrant that puts you in the top right corner and I chuck that out and I say, right, okay, let's have a conversation. And if I like the people, because we not so much like them, we've got to be able to get on because business is not a hockey stick, it's a bumpy road. And when you're at the bottom of those bumps and the S, it's the fan, and you fall out, can you quickly repair and recover and get on? And you know, be able to speak frankly and say whatever. So I think it's probably four or five things that I've actually said there. Those things in combination are, are what tips it for me. Yeah, can we just go to get some online questions, please, Wendy? And also just to say, there can be prizes awarded for the best questions, so I might claim these as my own. Right. Um, what has been Minerva's biggest miss from an investment perspective? What's our biggest miss in, from an investment? Well, we probably don't know, and to be perfectly honest, because um, some of the companies that we've seen, we don't really track. Um, We've actually invested over 100 companies, and traditionally, we invested in uh, small figures in early small startup spin-outs. Um, what we do have is a lot of companies that theoretically are dinosaurs. They're plodding along, and they're not really going anywhere. They become lifestyle businesses. So you could say we missed the opportunity to pick those superstars that are going to rock it. The, the highest return we've got is 12 times initial investment. However, some of those early startups have a gestation period of uh, 10 to 14 years. So we're now seeing uh, recycling technologies. They're going for an IPO. That could be a big, big gainer. We're, we're seeing um, another one, Lightpoint. They're also going for an IPO. Again, another big gainer. Have we lost any? Probably. Um, one was Go Banana, who came to us recently. Uh, and in that way, in that one, they didn't want to pay any fees. They just wanted to go for a quick injection of cash, and they got some American investors. There was another case where, that we had where they came to us, and they were actually students who were running out of money, uh, but they'd already got a term sheet offer of, with a valuation of $14 million and an investment of $20 million. So we were not quick enough to get into that. And that was a really early investment. So yes, do we miss something? Do we miss some from the spin outs of the university? Yes, Warwick had a spin out that made 40 times original initial investment. So we do miss some of them. Um, and that is because we can't get in early enough. Um, and again, 
We are trying to change that by being everywhere and anywhere, and that's why we now work very closely with our university partners across the Midlands, which generates more intellectual property than Cambridge and Oxford combined. So we have a lot of talent now coming out of these universities. And we also work with another programme that covers from Sheffield down to the coast in terms of early technology that we support, including some exciting battery technology, wind farming technology, and even 3D printing. So we're in at the start. One, one more from online, then we'll go back. And this one is, is there any evidence that valuations for UK pre-seed and seed rounds are lower outside London? No. <laughs> it's your response. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll just answer that one list. Anybody else wants to add in? I'll, I'll add in when you... Yeah, yeah. In terms of valuations, um, a valuation is a guess. It's a high, it's your, an educated guess. It's the best money you can get for the houses for sale. Um, a high valuation of 25 million that we see for a cargo bike dropped to 15 million. If you come in too high, you don't raise the money. In terms of London valuations and Midlands valuations, Midlands valuations are lower. Those from the Northwest are lower still. Those on Crowdcube and Seeds are high. Okay, but there's a leveling, a leveling out effect that happens as you move along the investment chain. Uh, investments coming off Crowdcube and Cedars, for example, when they're going to institutional investors, you may get a down round. So a valuation is taken from 10 million down to 5 million because the institutional investors won't pay that. Um, a high valuation doesn't necessarily mean it will retain its value as it goes through the process because the more money you put in, the more likely you're going to get a down round. I think another big influencing factor in terms of valuation, particularly in our game, which is the early stage, is the competence capability of the individuals who are doing the pitch. That is what is a big driver in terms of valuation, and that what can create a differentiator between the Midlands and London. Sorry, Elizabeth. Ditto. I thought you were going to say the opposite. I, was, I thought you were going to say there was no evidence of it. I was going to say there's plenty of evidence of it. Yeah. Just on one of my uh, pet subjects, valuations. Um, it's right that people are ambitious and obviously try and realise top dollar for their, for their business. They should at least be prepared to answer some difficult questions on how the valuation was arrived at. And I cease to be astounded at people asking for, I consider, ridiculous valuations and don't even, haven't even made the effort to try and justify it in some objective uh, way. So, but uh, I guess when there's such a wall of money, it, uh, it's very much a seller's market at times. But, you know, I'm, I'm amazed that people don't get embarrassed as they try and defend the valuations. Elliot's raised one of the, the most recently. How did you find the valuation process? Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's difficult and uh, I mean we, we fully expected that question of how did you come to this um, and you know we, we, we tried to make it as data driven as possible but there's only so much data you can pump into at uh, this stage of, of business so um, yeah just do as much as you can on that, get some feedback on it because they'll tell you straight away if they don't, they don't like it um, and um, yeah just it, adjust it from there. Well, you heard Elizabeth say, if you drive a valuation on internal rate of return or discounted cash flow um, on the forecast as a hockey stick, she's just going to throw it away anyway. So, I mean, it has to always be tempered with that. And Steve, did you, valuation, what did you find? Uh, it's certainly more of an art than a science. Um, however, we did go about thinking through, actually, if I was an investor, what am I going to be comfortable with? Because clearly I could go ask for multi-tens of millions. It would be fantastic if I was able to find investors who would be willing to, to throw that sort of money at me. But it's just totally unrealistic because, again, investors are looking for return on their cash. So if they buy in too expensively, you've got a big problem just brewing because you're not going to be able to then deliver the value back to the investor. So therefore, I, took, I, I went and got some help as well from um, people who are dealing with IP and IP valuation from other financial uh, people just to help me say what is actually a reasonable valuation for the type of business that we are 
and what's the reasoning behind that that I can then give to the investors to say, look, actually this is quite reasonable. So yes, I did get questioned about it when I did the pitches, but I had an answer available at those pitches to say, look, I think this is reasonable because, and we'd looked at it two or three different ways, but I couldn't hand on heart say, and here's the mathematical reasoning that shows exactly down to the penny why it's this and not that. Uh, so there is a certain amount of art to it as opposed to uh, science, I would suggest. And what's, one last point. Why are the valuations in the UK lower than the United States? Well, one of those reasons is, is the American companies come to the founder and they take nearly all your shares. And they give you the ability to earn those shares back. So the valuation can be higher because it increases their book value. So that's another one of the drivers that you see. And not many people realize that it's in the interest of those people investing in terms of the book value they take on their books, but you don't realize those shares are mainly held by them institutions and you have to earn back. Now there's a burning question at the back, or hopefully it's burning, so take one from the floor and one from the online, and then we'll have a top tip from each of our colleagues on the panel. Hi, yeah. um, so I'm, I'm building my companies at the moment and we know that we want to sell the business in, we've got this sort of sept, September 2024 dream. Don't, don't know why it's September 2024. We don't need any, we don't think additional capital to grow the company. And we're almost sort of under the radar completely. So when would you start to put your company on the investor's radar or sort of the investor circuit's radar if you're selling into September 2024? And is there any sort of obvious places to do it because we've heard some people start to sort of court investors like three years out two years out one year out I don't know if there's a sort of rule of thumb or a minimum sort of net profit that you should that's when you should start speaking to people well clearly with Elizabeth and David selling their businesses well we'll pass it over to them were you saying you want to sell your business in 2024 um, right I sold my business and all we did was our first money that we raised was IPO there was no raises prior to that and as a result of that we ended up with a lower valuation and a lower sale price than our second our next competitor who listed recently for 150 million with a much weaker product and a much weaker business than we had but what they had done was use the tactic of strategic raises I'm sorry I'm ducking down so I can see you under the stairs they use the tactic of strategic raises which is you may not need the money but you raise anyway when you've got certain metrics in place and you raise in order to get hooked in a valuation with the right investors. And you keep doing that two or three times before you exit because every one of those will then help you to get the right exit price as you go out. So I would say don't hide it under a bushel, take something at least in order to get there. And the other thing I would say to you is that, and this harks back to the previous question, when we, because we were listed, we, you have a broker that takes you around the investors and they advise you on how to present yourself, etc. And the, the lesson that I was taught was that investors are basically lazy, particularly VCs. So they look for the read across. They look for other metrics around them, other firms in the same sector, um, you know, other, other transactions that have happened. And actually, if you do something that is out of kilter with what they're used to seeing, it makes them stop and think and get nervous and not, want, not necessarily want to invest. And I think that applies the same also if you're looking to sell, it's no different. You're actually looking for someone to buy you in the same way. So you want to be able to, if you don't take the investment route, you want to at least be able to present yourself as though you were looking for investment, comparing your metrics with stuff that your potential buyers would actually know, particularly if you're going down the sort of PE route. Um, you know as an exit and that's one thing you could do is actually do a bit of PE first take some money off the table take their expertise grow it again you know and then and then said it but don't go straight to IPO like I did that's that was a that was a mess that turned into a lesson and although we passed on time I think we can keep going a little bit uh, last session so if people yeah. start leaving it's not because they don't like you it's just because it's the end of the day yeah uh, David quickly I would uh, agree with most of what uh, Elizabeth said. It, it took us years, actually, from testing the water, and I agree, why wouldn't you test the water? 
and we ended up um, actually selling for eight times more four years later than the, the first offer. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually interested in why you say you don't need money to grow the business. Um, that, that, that's probably a separate discussion, but the, that's an interesting one, because if the business has real growth potential, could it be you're constraining that growth potential by being somewhat undercapitalized and underfunded? I don't know, but it's, it's not something I, I hear very often. And, and I can repeat what Elizabeth said, because we had a, one, of the big, one of the main reasons business failed, not the only one, is you have a powerful investor who dictates the agenda, who definitely does, who des doesn't know the market. So we turned away 500 million investment from the Japanese. Well, it was an acquisition for the technology. And we were, we were and I have to use this, testosterone-driven warriors, which is a terrible phrase, but it, were, it, it, it adequately describes where you're driven by emotion rather than common sense, which I'm sure lots of people will agree with. And we thought we were going to conquer the world. And when we came to the end where the, this principal investor got in financial trouble because he borrowed seven billion and already given us 72 million people the farmer industry said you're having a laugh aren't you we don't know you we don't know where you've come from we don't know what you've got and we you think we're going to buy in your your technology you know and again it repeats what elizabeth says that you know unfortunately People expect you to perform in a certain way. Some of them want to get involved as well with a view to supporting that, that sale at the end of this, uh, the situation. So again, strategic uh, investment can be important. Do we want to take one more question of the... Of okay. Well, one last question and then we'll have from our panel the top tip for today. Uh, hi, a uh, really quick one. What percentage of companies you're approached by you invest in? Us. That's, a, that's actually a more difficult question because we've upped our game. So we used to have 35 companies pitch. We now have 80. Um, typically, it's about 10 to 20 percent receive investment from Minerva. Um, we're, we're doing bigger ticket sizes, and since July, we uh, have under discussion over 3 million, which is not what we've done before. I mean, has anybody else got any comments in terms of what they invest in? So again, 30% 30, 30, 30 receive something financially. I would say 50 to 60% receive advice, support, contacts, connections, which also has value. And please don't underestimate the value of that. I mean, in, in Steve's case, excellent example, some of our investors have introduced him to another company which is on a major growth um, pattern with cargo bikes to use his technology to help develop a better product. And, and that connectivity between those investors and this other, other opportunity can be very valuable indeed. So as we draw to a close, what is the top tip for investor and for founder moving forward just one tip so if you give the top tip that you think from a founder's perspective for anybody looking for money and then we'll go around so i think be very clear obviously about why you're raising whatever it is you want to raise um, you are bringing other people into the business it's not just about the money it's about what else those investors can do so we've had an example uh, there with one of my investors who's helping us with other market but frankly I've actually got investors in the business who have a wealth of business experience who are able to I'm able to bounce ideas off them and 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 really I'm very experienced in business but my experience I know means that I know very little so it's great having a whole bunch of other people who've done some great things and usefully also they've had failures so it's fantastic to have that so my advice is to learn to speak angel, learn to speak VC, and maybe one day you learn to talk PE and, and IPO, but, but really get to understand those, those people, how they take them, how you can use them positively, because they're putting their money and their faith into your business. How do you get them a return? Elliot, top tip for the founders out there? Uh, I would say uh, don't, don't be that person to try and do it all yourself. Um, find someone that has been through it before that can support you and um, uh, be a massive uh, point of point of feedback as well. And talk to the investors like people. You know, have a have a conversation with them, and you'll get the most out of it. I think. David, top tip for investors out there. <clears throat> um, 
There's a lot, but I, I'd probably say when you're uh, asking for cash, be very clear uh, as to what, how you will deploy that cash. And I mean very clear. Too often I hear people raising and asking for significant sums of cash and very scant um, explanation of how that cash will be deployed to ensure there's a good return, but more importantly, to drive, drive the business. Elizabeth? Can I do three? Um, I probably will anyway. Um, mm -hmm. You don't need more than 12 slides and a financial forecast to actually raise money, so don't write war and peace. So do 12 slides and your forecast and go pitch, practice pitching and keep refining that. So that would be, I'll just stick to the one. Shall I just, shall it be good? Or shall I go a bit more? Well, um, from the investors, you're doing the founders. What's your, invest, what's your tip for the investor? As in, if you are an investor to yeah, them. Yeah, you get one of each. I think, I think you have, to, I think everybody should do it. Um, but don't be, don't try to be a VC when you're an, an angel. And some of the toughest money that I actually raised was actually from retail investors, which would be angels. Um, and they can ask you know, some really ridiculous questions. So if you're going to be an investor, um, ask a balanced set of questions. And as you said, a lot of it comes down to gut feel. And don't put on, don't bet on the ponies that you can't afford, money you can't afford to lose, basically. I suppose my top tip is listen. Listen to the founders. Listen to the investors, listen to your critics, keep an open mind, realize it's an imperfect science. Um, don't believe you've got the lottery numbers and you can pick the best lottery winners, particularly if you're an investor. Get involved, support. If we don't get involved, we can't grow, we can't create jobs, we can't, can't create unicorns, um, and we need to do that. And one of the things that I hate is all the money moves down south. So can we please get everybody involved, a rallying cry to the people in the Midlands and the Northwest and get our act together. We talk about a leveling up agenda. There's actually a lot of cash around here, but what we lack is investors, investor founders to help the founders grow the business, create those unicorns, create those successes, because success breeds success. So that's something that we really need, particularly in uh, anything which is, south, which is sorry, north of Watford. So on that note, I'd like to thank everybody for attending, everybody for attending the day today. It's really appreciated. It's good to see some real faces in the flesh. You always look taller than you do on Zoom, which is amazing to me. Um, and uh, it's been a pleasure to be here today. So I'd like to echo my thanks to the, to the panel today. Um, they've been fantastic. And to all of our other speakers and our exhibitors too. Um, and a special word of thanks to my team who we've seen running around. We've been running around for days. <laughs> and I think they'll all crawl out of here tonight. But they've done a fantastic job. So thank you, team. Um, just remains to say, I think the exhibition is, is packing away. But if you had a fantastic day, that's absolutely brilliant. We're really pleased. We're hoping to host more of these. We want to see more people in our spaces now that they're open. Do follow us, do um, check us out online, do l register for our newsletter, you'll find out all the fun things that are gonna go on afterwards, and it will also signpost you to any of the programs and activities that you've seen showcased today. I really do hope you've had a, a, a great time. Any feedback of any kind, bring it on. It's our first event in this space, so if we can do it better next time, we'd love to know how, um, and we'll try and fix those things for you. So once again, thanks very much for, for coming, and thank you very much to our panel.